Well, you can be seated for now, but do open your Bibles, if you would, to really a montage of Scripture. We are now part two of a three-part series titled His Return. And I'm curious, just to help me out, please, um, how many of you were not here last week? Uh, don't worry about it. We're not going to have a test. I just need to know how much I need to re, uh, re- view. And so n- not enough of you to, to review. That's, that's the deal. Uh, so uh, get the study from last week. We're, we're approaching this in a different way, the, the Christmas series. We annually do a Christmas series, and this year it's different than normal. And we're taking up what I would consider, with all due respect, and I do mean this in, uh, regarding uh, me saying this, that um, I expect, you guys are students of the Bible, I expect um, you guys to know more than the average churchgoer. <laughs> And that's not putting down any other church. It's just that we spend a lot of time in the Bible here. And um, I'm expecting and assuming that a deep dive into why th- there is a Christmas uh, is, is good for us, that we can be reminded if we don't already know. And we can also formulate and articulate arguments, I mean that in, in a loving way, arguments for those that we'll co- be coming in contact with during this uh, celebration this Christmas season. That is that we'd be able to challenge them as to why we're even participating uh, in Christmas in the first place. Now, technically, as a believer, we participate in Christmas every single day as believers, don't we? So we're looking at his return. This is our second study. We laid the foundation of the fact, and remember, I'm going to push it all the way through, and that is the Christmas account is an account of actual events. The Christmas event is not a storied event. It's not a story. It's not the greatest story ever told. It's the greatest account of an event ever recorded. And so we want to challenge the world right now with that. We saw last time, and I'm not going to go through all of it, but we learned that there's an overriding theme and you can go about and pick many theme verses or chapters of the Bible to back up Christmas. But for me, this is the one that carries the greatest punch. In fact, it's a, it's a dual hit from John and from Genesis, as you might remember. In John 1, the Bible tells us, now remember, in, the, in light of Christmas, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning, that is, of all the physical created universe, and that it also includes created beings, such as angels. He was with God, and all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Well, who is this word? Who is this one that is God? Verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, and all God's people said to that, amen. Amen. And then we jump on over to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Do you remember this? I was quite happy with your response, by the way, to discover. You came up to me after service and said, I never thought about that before. That Genesis 3.15 is not only a soteriological verse, big word, meaning the first verse given in the Bible that God promises to redeem back mankind out of his sin... But it's also the first eschatological verse, meaning it's the first prophecy in the Bible. And what's the prophecy given? It's not only redemption. How did redemption come? Redemption came to us in Bethlehem. A little baby was born. What an unassuming advent of God's great plan to break the bonds of Satan and sin to come into the world himself. I'm so glad that God didn't send an angel. Aren't you? An angel wasn't born in Bethlehem. God was born in the flesh in Bethlehem. Absolutely awesome. How do we know that? Genesis 3, verse 15. Remember, the Lord is speaking after the fall, and you can see them lined up right there. There's the serpent that's possessed by Satan. There's Adam and there's Eve. And the Bible there, as God speaks, says, and I, that is the Lord, will put enmity, and you can almost see the Lord pointing at the serpent, between you and the woman. He's referencing Eve, but Eve's offspring. And between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head. That is the seed that is coming from a woman will crush Satan's head, and and Satan will crush his heel. 
Satan will inflict pain upon the life of the Messiah coming into the world, but the Messiah's work would crush the head, the authority, the domain, the power of the devil himself. And we need to remember that, church, because Satan, according to the Bible, is a judged foe. He's an adversary, the Bible says, who goes about seeking whom he may devour. And none of us are exempt from this. He goes around seeing what he can do to create mischief in your life. And so listen, basically two things. There are those who are protected by the power of God, and Satan will come and attack, and that is for our development. God will use Satan to develop his children. We know this from the book of Job, by the way. But then there's also the fact that those who are not Christians, they're open game for the tyrannical deceptions of Satan. One more before we get going is 1 John. Same, same John. This is the same John that wrote the Gospel of John. In 1 John chapter 1, it says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, listen to this, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled. John is saying, I touch the word of God. Concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifest to us. We got to talk to him. We got to see him eat. We ate with him. We touched him. We held his hand. We could hear his voice. Can you imagine what did the voice of Jesus sound like? I mean, I'm assuming that it sounded like an, any common voice. I don't think it was like, Hi, John, this is Jesus. I don't think he sounded like some television preacher. I think he sounded kind of normal, but I, everybody's got a signature voice of their own. I would have loved to have heard his voice, but we don't have to wait too long. We're going to hear his voice. In fact, the voice that we're listening for is, Come up here. And uh, I hope that happens today. I hope that happens right now. I need it to happen today. How about that? <laughs> Verse 3 says, That which, which we have seen and which we have heard and declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. Which is why we look, number one, at the promise of his return. We were blessed by that. Number two, last week we saw the purpose of his return. And thirdly, last week we saw the proclamation of his return. And in every one of the events, and it's the, it's the theme that undergirds this entire series, is that God not only announced in Genesis that he was going to return to redeem mankind, and he came, born in Bethlehem, we call it Christmas, but all along the way there's always this returning of God back to the world Frankly, the world that he loves. Think about this. The world has fallen and it hates him. But you're in this world. Thus he loves you. But he's also going to redeem the world. He's not going to flush it down the, the celestial toilet. He's going to redeem it. And that's quite awesome. Number four in our study. Number four. Write it down. Here we go. His return is this. There's an environment to his return. The environment of his return. So what do you mean by that? Well, number one, write this down. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. This is awesome. You guys listening? Yes. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Now, that's a huge statement. But you have to understand something carefully, everybody. You say, wait a minute. Does that mean God is going to tell us everything before it happens? No. This is very, very interesting doctrine regarding the nature of God. And you might want to write it down. And that is called the predictive nature of God. Predictive. God allows himself to be known very well in certain areas. There are areas of God's revelation to us that we know somewhat. And then there's areas that God is reserved and it's the bulk of his revelation. And that is going to be eternity in heaven with him discovering it. You see, what, what do you mean by this? We mean that God has revealed enough in the word of God for you to know him, to repent of your sins, to accept him as Lord and Savior, and to have him as your guide through life. And when the end of life comes or where the trumpet goes, you go up and you see him and everything that you and I need in this life is in this book. But 
John said, if I were to write down everything concerning Christ, there's not enough books in the world to contain his very person and character. What he says and what he's going to say. The predictive nature of God. But it goes deeper. So, for example, in the book of Romans 11, verses 33 to 34, you can just reference the verse. It's not going to be on the screens. The Bible tells us there, who has known the mind of the Lord? See, he's challenging us. I'm predictive. That is to the things that I've revealed. See, Jack, help me out. What God has revealed, he will do. You can bank on him. That's the predictive nature of God. God is one who we don't know what he's going to do next, but we know this, it will be in line with his word, the Bible. This is important. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, the Bible says, Who has known the mind of God that can instruct him? We can't. We try. Hey, God, let me tell you how to do it. That doesn't work. But we are talking about the predictive patterns of God in the Bible. And from Genesis, I love saying what I'm about to say. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all about redemption. It's all about the Messiah Savior who purchases redemption. And it's all about him keeping his word. And that is awesome. So listen, there's conditions. I'm going to get into the breakdown of this point, but... The environment of his return. Mark this down if you would. It's uh, Matthew chapter 4, verse 13. Matthew 4, 13. And leaving Nazareth, he, Jesus, came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the regions of Zebulon and Naphtali, that, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet, saying, the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali by way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles... The people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region of the shadow of death, light has dawned. Notice, Matthew was saying this regarding the prophet Isaiah, and both attribute this to the Messiah. What is Matthew talking about? Why did he say this? And why did he say it like that? Well, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 1. We remember this from last week. Isaiah 9, 1. By way of the sea, Isaiah says... Beyond the Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light has shined or dawned. Church family, in your argument, know this. Christmas is the fulfillment of Isaiah. And Matthew, 2,000 years ago, understood that the prophet of Isaiah's prophecy was being fulfilled. That is admissible in the courtroom. Eyewitness account says, this is what I'm going to say about what I just saw. Isaiah's prophecy was fulfilled. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. From that time, Jesus began to preach. That's just the next verse out of Matthew. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's what you want to have family do at this Christmas, do you not? Have them change their mind about what it's all about. I read in the, I don't want to, I, I kind of didn't want to say this, and I definitely didn't put the uh, headlines up because I didn't want you to be depressed, but it was either Forbes or one of the things that I read on a weekly basis, it was either The Economist or Forbes or New York Times, I don't know what it was, but it said there in the, in the headline of the article, it said, enjoy this Christmas because it may be the last as we know it. And it was talking about everything coming together. It was written by a non-believer. It's talking about everything coming together to basically remove Christmas from the priority that we've enjoyed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. Meaning the economy, safety, uh, the culture, you name it. Everything is shifting. Everything is turning. I highly suggest you grab onto the Bible like never before. You should make 2024 a year where you dial down, turn off the TV, turn off stuff, and get into the Bible because, listen, it's going to be a matter of life and death how much you know this Bible it is. Very, very important. So here we go. As we look at this, the environment of his return will be like this, preempted by the rise of evil. Can you write that down? 
This is what you can talk about over your Christmas turkey with your non-believing friends. Well, the environment of Christ's return, as it was back then, even back from the Garden of Eden, is the same today. There's going to be a preemptive age whereby evil will be on the rise. Everybody knows this. Your aunt, she knows it. Your dad, your kids are going to be at the table. They already know it. They may not want to admit it, but there's a rise of evil. And evil, by the way, is getting very swanky. Um, it's not for this time, but there's a... There's an app that you parents need to know about that is the number one downloaded app now in the world. We'll talk about it some other day, but you need to make sure that you are monitoring your kid's stuff or your wife's stuff or your husband's stuff. Why? Evil's on the rise and it gets all dressed up and it looks really great on the surface. Oh, look at this, look at that, and it's so cute. And it's so cute for a little bit until the narrative, the real reason, draped, cloaked. As I said earlier, the devil is like a lion roaming about. I don't think a lion announces his arrival. You know, a lion roars. Even the book of Proverbs tells us that a lion roars after it catches its prey. The lion doesn't go, roar! Here I come. <laughs> you can't tell when he's coming. Or worse yet, worse than a lion would be the, the lioness. She's the killer. The guy just sits around, eats stuff, and makes baby lions. She's the one. And she is just absolute. Well, the Bible says Satan is like a lion. That means he's like a lion against your children, against your marriage, against your home, against your life. Against this church. If there's anything that's challenging darkness, the rise of evil will come against it. Just know that. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, again, all of this, I'm going to argue, is all related to Christmas. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times that uh, some will depart from the faith. Just don't make, Just make sure it's not you. Giving heed, this is why they depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits. In other words, translation, modern day vernacular, stop listening to stupid stuff. Well, I know this guy's kind of weird, but he teaches the Bible. I just find him interesting. Turn him off! (laughs) Judge this pulpit and every pulpit and every person by the Bible, friends. You do that, you'll survive. If not, this is what's going to happen. You'll give heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. When your conscience is seared with a hot iron, you no longer have any feeling anymore. Cold-blooded killers of character, of soul, and of body. They can gut somebody, as it were, and walk away and feel nothing. And I ask you, In the rise of evil in the last days before Christ returns, are we not living in a time like this? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. But know this. By the way, that's a command. Know it. Paul told Timothy, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. I do believe they're here. I'm not making it up. This is what I believe. This is one reporter's opinion. I believe we're in them. We're in the opening days of these perilous times, that they will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. I'm glad that's not happening. (laughs) Lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving. Wow, an angry, bitter culture, right? Slanders. That is the natural result, by the way, of being all of that ungroup. You start slandering people without self control. Sin does not have self control, it always goes overboard. Brutal. Despisers of good, traitors, they never keep their word. Headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. Isn't that something? Wearing a cross around their neck. A Christian sticker on their bumper. They deny its power. From such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households. Can you imagine? Imagine? They get their foot in the door and they take Captives, gullible women, loaded down with sins. 
That is a scary word because it means, watch, led away by various lusts. It means that there's going to be an age when women are going to be obsessed with passion, lust, and perversion. And the Bible says in the last days that there are going to be these women that are compromised by sin, that are gullible to being, what's the word, um, flattered. Always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres resisted Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds disapproved concerning the faith. That's serious stuff, everybody. The environment re regarding Christ's coming, it's a predictive environment. Notice that God's offer of salvation, class, are you listening? God's offer of salvation came during evil, Genesis 3, didn't it? God promised salvation after the fall. God promises the Messiah to come, and he came 2,000 years ago, in the decadent world of the Roman Empire. And Jesus said when he returns, it's going to be like it was in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. Remarkable, is it not? Listen, I hope I'm turning this boat around a little bit. I mean, you're, for a moment there, you're feeling like you're going to crash into some iceberg. Wait a minute. All the darkness we're seeing is the darkness that is just before the light. The predictive nature of God is that he shows up when things are dark. So how dark are things? Oh, they're dark. Then what can we expect? Maybe a revival in the church in the world? Maybe right here? Maybe in America? Maybe. It's not too late until the fat angel sings. But church, as long as we're breathing, history can still be written. America's a mess, but what if America's pulpit started preaching truth? What if, what if people didn't care anymore about what people thought or said or posted and just preached the gospel? Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. It's, don't let the evil get you down. Oh, it's so evil. Yes, it is. We should say, you know what? Boy, is it getting evil. Christ is coming. Every time in evil, there's the opportunity to shine. Every time. Always evil is indicative of dark and night and heaviness. And yet, all of our biblical heroes that we love reading about in the Bible all came out during dark times. In Romans chapter 8, this is uh, a... This would put some long, uh, air in your lungs. Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? <laughs> we could stop right there and spend the whole rest of the day right there. What shall we say to these things? All of these crazy demonic laws and actions and a nation adrift and a, a husband uh, this way or a wife that way or children the other or parents what? What? What shall we say to these things? This is what we say to these things. We need to stand up and maybe verbally just speak this in our homes. Preach to your house. Go to each room and preach to your, uh, your home. If God is for us, who can be against us? Oh, I can tell you who. The point is, everybody eventually is going to be against you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You want to know why? Because if God is for us, who can be against us? That's a statement of fact. <laughs> Translation, it doesn't matter who's against you. God's for you. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall we not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? For it is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It's Christ who died and furthermore is risen. Who is even at the right hand of God? Who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us? Notice, not what, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, as it is written, for your sake we are killed all the day long, we are accounted as sheep, for the slaughter, Paul was talking about being, being a minister of the gospel to the church. 
Ministers of the gospel die daily. I don't know if you know that or not. You want to sign up for ministry? Sign up for, know this. Ministry 101, you're going to die daily. You're going to get your feelings dashed. You're going to be get disappointed. Someone's going to stab you in the back. The next person that picks you up, the next guy that comes along, is going to push you down. It's okay. Because God is for us. Who can be against us? Right? You say, I don't know if I like that analogy. It's not an analogy. Read the life of Paul the Apostle. <laughs> Verse 37, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, you got to hang on to that word, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels, principalities or powers, demonic strongholds that are invisible even, nor things present nor things to come, that's tomorrow's headlines, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And you said amen, amen to that. The second thing is this, is it's preempted by the increase of sin. We don't need to belabor this. The environment of his re return will be preempted by the increasing of not only evil, but of sin. When Jesus was born into this world, the Roman Empire like all empires without God, was violent. I don't, I don't rec I mean, you, there's a movie with Russell Crowe. Do you know what I'm saying? About the Roman Empire. I don't want to say it because it's not, it's, it's got some tough parts in it. And I don't endorse the movie. I'm just telling you that it was obvious whoever made that movie was pretty accurate about the disgusting hedonism of the Roman world. Violent, decadent, pleasure-obsessed, sexually deviant culture given over to vile passions the Roman Empire was. But so was the Persian and the Medes, the Greeks, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Assyrians. It never stops. The Americans. We've perfected sin. Romans chapter 1 is an expose of a culture 2,000 years ago, one of the most accurate, shocking insights into the Roman world that has ever been written. Rome worshipped the human body. We go into museums and we see the art. Well, there's a whole life behind that art. Rome worshipped its military prowess. Rome worshipped its materialism and idols. Rome worshipped nature and its environment. Rome worshipped the entertainment of death. They called it the Colosseum. You know what? They didn't start out that way, by the way. Oh, and I'm curious. Diversion. Are you familiar with why the killings stopped in the Colosseum? Do you know how that happened? A Christian rebuked the emperor. And said, this is wrong, immoral, and evil, and it's debased, ignorant, and decadent that this arena, the sand, be turned into a killing place. And he said, you're going to answer to God someday for this. That emperor was so convicted, the, the death games at the Colosseums throughout the empire were stopped immediately. One Christian stood up. Never underestimate your voice when you're speaking for God in his word. Ever. Ever. God knows how to deal with the increase of sin. Here's that world that Paul was talking about in Rome 2,000 years ago. Because although they, they knew God, they did not glorify him as God. Could that be said of America? Nor were they thankful. Wow. But became futile in their thoughts. And their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be Ivy League professors and presidents of <laughs> major universities, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Notice what, they give up on God. Notice what they worship. Images made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. That's evolution in reverse. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies among themselves. Think about what that must mean. I'm talking about just 2,000 years ago. So, man, that's, that must have been rough back then. 
who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever, amen, the Bible says. For this reason, God gave them up. He washed his hands of them. He turned them over. He walked away from their vile passions. He let them have them. That's a scary thing, everybody. If you keep hounding God for something, watch out because he might give it to you or let you have it. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men, leaving the nature, or natural, excuse me, use of a woman, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves internally the penalty of their error which was due. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. Are we not at an age that says, don't talk to me about God. We'll kill you if you talk about God. Get God out of our schools and out of our courts. For what? To worship nature. And who's at the top of the nature scene? We are. So let's worship us. This is why Christ came at Christmas to set us free from this, everybody. Does this offend you? Does this bother you? This is the truth of the word of God, the Bible. The Bible's not condemning you. The Bible is saying to you, see what I know? God is saying, look what I know. Do you know what I know? God says, I know. I see this. He's asking you to turn from this. Please turn from this. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them over to a debased mind, perverted mind, debased mind, reprobate mind, to do those things which are not fitting. Strong words, right? That's in the Bible. So what does this have to do with Christmas? Everything. That's why he came. That's why he came to set us free from this. You think Satan likes Christmas or he hates Christmas? He hates it. Why? Because of stuff like this. He breaks. The third thing under this point is preempted by an age of deception. False religions are to be assumed. They're recorded throughout history from the beginning. In fact, if you want to think about it, Eve was the mother of the first religion, false religion. She saw that that fruit would make her like God. And so she took of it. Paganism, ancient Babylonianism, has been the birthplace of cults and the occult, the rise. And is it interesting that all around the United States today, there's a rise of the Church of Satan being established and satanic groups hosting, on the National Day of Prayer, satanic prayers in civic centers in the United States. Well, you know what, though? If the church doesn't show up to the civic center and pray, Amen. they just fill the void. And when I say environment, I mean atmospherics, if you want to put it that way, has always been charged by deception and falsehood. Satan is the father of all lies. Wow, you know, I'm going to give an endorsement for a film right now. It just pops into my head. Could get in trouble for this. Lisa and I went and saw the movie. I think we might have been the only people in the theater. It's too bad. It's a modern day takeoff from the book of Job called, um, what's it called? The Shift. And that guy, he's a Christian, by the way. The guy that plays Satan. How'd you like to have that? Hey, I'm a Christian. I'll play Satan. (laughs) The guy, you know, is a very famous actor. Man, he, if a guy can act like that on a movie screen and be so convincing, imagine how convincing Satan is. The Shift. The atmospherics. Jesus came to take on the forces of darkness in human flesh. And if it wasn't bad enough for Adam to have encountered Satan personally on a level of deception that frankly no other human being has ever experienced. But ever since that explosion of deception, he has continued on from that moment till now. Evil was increasingly present before God gave his promise of redemption. I said that earlier. Evil was increasingly present. Increasingly present. Notice that. And how does evil manifest itself? Or why does it do it? Because of sin. There's a lot in my notes. For time's sake, I'm going to have to skip some of these things. I'll brush over this. Look at it later. Maybe we can write the reference down. And I'll just paraphrase it. Jesus said, you don't have to be bummed out about this. 
In Luke chapter 17, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. People were drinking, they got married, they did their stuff, they lived their lives, they did whatever until the day that Noah entered in the ark. And then the flood came and they were all washed away. Jesus said that regarding the days of Noah, it's going to be like that at the end times. The Bible says, what were the days of Noah? Genesis 6 verse 5. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Bible says, and the Lord was sorry. The word in Hebrew means mournful, sickened to the stomach, brokenhearted that he made man on the earth and he was grieved. That word grieved in Hebrew is pained, injured, wounded in his heart. Isn't that amazing? That should actually bless you, that God is God who can be wounded in the heart. And so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from off the face of the earth. Evil continually. You can look later at Matthew 24, verses 10 through 12, or Luke chapter 12, verses 52 to 56. I wrote this down, friends, uh, the other day, and um, I actually forgot about it. And I, I, I need you to hear this. Even at this Christmas time, perhaps more now than ever before, when we say Christmas, you know the first word is Christ. Let's remember that. How well you know your Bible. I should have said, in the coming near future, if not now, how well you know your Bible is not a luxury, nor is it an option. The days of deception are upon us, and they will increase. Without his word embedded in your heart and mind, you will not survive the coming storm. So when we say Merry Christmas, what we're actually saying is, it's a Merry Christmas to those who understand what it's all about. It's not a holiday. It's a life. Amen. It's a total consciousness of who he is. It doesn't come around every 365 days. For many of us who are believers, it's a literal existence. And the days are coming that knowing your Bible will not be a luxury. Look, honestly, you know why things are a luxury? Listen, if you're an atheist right now, you can have the luxury of being an atheist. But when you have cancer, atheists have a tendency to call churches. Did you know that? You have the luxury right now to do whatever you want to do because you're fine until that lump appears or until that situation is handed to you and then you don't, listen the luxury evaporates and you've got to meet reality the same is true in this world Jesus said as we approach the end that everything that can be shaken shall be shaken and only which can remain shall remain Christmas is understanding that the word of God is literally alive and real and it's the only thing that is going to save you this Christmas. Is this heavy? It is heavy. It has to be heavy. Number five, his return is the essence of his return. The, by essence, I mean this, the message and the mission that God confronted evil, sin, and the essence by his appearing in Eden, by his appearing in Bethlehem, and by his second coming. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, but when the fullness of time had come, this is amazing, God had a perfect appointment. You know Mary, it's amazing to think that Mary went into labor, not because she was at nine months, I'm assuming nine months, I wasn't there, I don't know. It just says the time came for her to give birth. Was Jesus a week late? Was he a week early? Nope. Exactly. He was right on time. Oh, there's a song that... I know white people try to sing it. It just doesn't work. I'm, I've tried, but it's, he's an on-time kind of God. Yes, he is. Only the black community can sing that right. 
It is awesome. God's never early. God's never late. He's always on time. Amen. And the Bible says right here that in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Hey, sounds like Genesis 3.15. To redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons. That is Genesis 3.15. And we learned this about it. The essence of his return always brings about the conviction. I wanted to get this out on a service today. I wanted to get it out as public record and on media forever because once, once we broadcast something, you know that, church, everything, by the way, you post is out there forever. I want this to be out there forever because there's a great movement to make illegal the Holy Spirit's work in the world. You say, what? Don't be, uh, don't be deceived in the days of deception. When people say, that just made me uncomfortable. I'm going to call my attorney. <laughs> Sorry, people don't talk like that, but when I hear them say that, that's how I hear it in my head. <laughs> you may be as big as Goliath. I still hear you talking like this. You hurt my feelings, and I'm going to sue you. And I could say to somebody, for God so loved the world, and they're going, mm, that's nice, that he gave his only begotten son, right on, that whosoever would believe in him, yes, I do, would not perish, but have everlasting life. Okay, hmm, perish, what are you saying? And that John 3, 16 goes on to tell you that those who do not accept that message are condemned. What? I'm suing you. You can stand for truth today and be sued in the courts tomorrow because the Holy Spirit convicted somebody and you were giving them the word of God. So tell me who's being sued, you or the Holy Spirit? It's the Holy Spirit. You ever think of that? Conviction. Conviction will save your life, my friend. If you're standing on the railroad tracks and somebody yells and says, get off the track and you don't do it, and then they tackle you, and knock you off the tracks and they scuff up their knee because you pushed them off the train tracks before the train, train came by. And they, what are they I'm going to sue you. You push me down. They don't even understand that you're trying to rescue their life. They're given over to deception. Always, always the conviction. Mark 1 verse 15. And Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. God says this is a must. See, this offends people right now. There's people right now, and when this gets rebroadcast, in fact, there'll be some state channels on TV. We want that part edited out. Why? It might upset somebody. You see, you see the world you and I live in? 1 John 4, 14. As he said, we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as, here's, this is offensive, Savior of the world. You guys know how offensive that is? So how's that offensive? Because the word savior means to save that which is lost. Secondly, it's this. Always brings about the consideration. The Bible tells us regarding Jesus being the essence itself of Christmas is the consideration of who he is. In Matthew chapter 2, verse 9, it says, And when they had heard... Herod the king, the wise men departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Look, don't look for this on astronomical charts. You don't have to study NASA's work on this or, you know, was it the alignment of this planet or that. This is a supernatural event. This, this star is moving, and I don't think it's a celestial orb. I think it's an angel of great brilliance. We just don't get a name or anything like that. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they were come to, into the house, they saw the young child with his mother, Mary, or Mary his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented to him gold, uh, gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. All of these things indicative of and perfect typological form of the entire life and ministry of Jesus. The consideration of Jesus is the essence of Christmas itself and regarding his return. Friends, the world right now is right on course. It's right on track according to the Bible. 
Christ is coming back if you believe it or not. He's coming back. He said he'd come back. He's coming back. I don't know when. You don't know when. No, God told me. No, he didn't tell you. I'm going to write a book. Go ahead. He didn't tell you. Nobody knows. The consideration. And then there's the challenge. There's always the bring about to the challenge. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. Boy, that's, <laughs> where's the wiggle room in this? And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Wow. And then finally, number six, his return is the effect of his return. Regarding his return, there's the effect. And by effect, I mean that the coming of Jesus Christ so changed the world for the good when he came 2,000 years ago in his advent. It resulted in the single most powerful influence that the world has ever known or ever will know. Did you know that? There's not another person. I, I literally bumped into somebody this last week, started talking about God, and I said, you need to read John. And she said, I'm sorry, who's John? Who's John? And I said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John? And she said, I don't know these men. I said, have you ever read the Bible? No, I've heard of the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, this happened in our community. You don't have to go to the dark forest of the Amazon. All you have to do is go to the shops. They had never heard. Wouldn't that be Satan's trick to get you to not only not hear, but if you have heard, to hear wrong? Mm. These three things were done. It results in the cleansing from this world. There's a cleansing. His return created a cleansing. The Bible tells us, Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. That's a great statement. God loved you so much, he called you his own kids. We're not worthy, are we? Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are the children of God and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be like, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. You want to know the Christmas Christ? He's going to affect your life, friend. He's going to start making you more and more into his image. Secondly, it results in the separation from this world. I hope I don't mess this one up. Listen to this. Galatians 2.20 says this. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you know what this means? This is what I'm afraid I'm going to be misunderstood. The power of what Jesus brings to us represented at Christmas is his life offered up and his resurrection power so great and grand that the life that you and I live now is no longer our, our life to live. We're now dead to our own desires and our own mission. We want to get our marching orders from heaven. And it's the Holy Spirit that we want to have driving the wheel. And having said that, the separation from this world, when this happens... When he gets a hold of us, don't be surprised and put up the final point. Don't be surprised if this doesn't happen. The results will be the embracing of this world. He said, what are you saying? When, we're, when the world is separated out of us, the Holy Spirit puts in the word of God. He builds you from the inside out, everybody. And he galvanizes you from the inside out, not from the outside in. See, we can take metal and we can put it and drip in a, and immerse it and then electrify it and galvanize it forevermore against the elements of the world, right? The, the weather. It's not going to rust. It's, it's just going to be galvanized. God doesn't do it from the outside. Because 
underneath the galvanizing, that pipe or that metal is still of its original origin. What God does is he starts galvanizing you inside your mind, inside you, your spirit. And eventually that galvanization of the Holy Spirit is lived out in your life. And this is how the world is embraced. You say, Jack, are you, say, are you telling us to embrace the world? Yes, but let me tell you what the definition is. Not to go back out there and be like the world again. He took it out of you, Christian. Oh, man, I, I, I better not do that. Listen, do you understand your salvation is absolutely invincible in Christ? He takes the world that once controlled you out of you. He puts the spirit of God in you. He begins to galvanize you through the Bible from the inside out. And then when that happens, guess what? Don't be surprised if he winds up having you speak to somebody at the office or at the hospital or at the, at the gas station. Why? What's he doing? He's sending you back into that horrible, wicked world that ruined your life. Why? Because, listen, you're preempting sin itself. This is what he's doing right now. C.S. Lewis says that God has deployed us into enemy-occupied territory. Leave this building today understanding. It's just not about parties and eggnog and cakes. It's a warfare that's going on. And the baby came to fight. And that baby that was born changed the entire course of the world, including the calendar that you live your day by. And he sets free all those who are bound by sin. He liberates us. And when the enemy comes knocking on the door, we have to remind him, I'm purchased goods. I've been delivered from the slave market of sin and death. And you have no hold on me anymore. A.W. Tozer said, you can stand, you can stand. A.W. Tozer said, A.W. Tozer said this. He said, when Satan reminds him of how bad of a Christian he is, Tozer says, I know. You did that to me, and I learned all that stuff I do that's bad. Notice this. From you. By the way, have you noticed how Satan works? Here's how Satan works if you don't know. Hey, so how you doing? Well, I'm doing good. Um, you should go do that. I don't think I'm allowed. I'll go ahead. Mm, I don't think it's good. I think, I think the Bible says I shouldn't be doing this. So, no, no, I'm not going to do it. God loves you. Come on. Everybody's doing it. What are you gonna, you're going to be the odd man out. And then what are you going to tell your friends when they ask you? And you say, no, I don't know what you mean. Come on. God is so forgiving anyway. Isn't he forgiving? He's so merciful. He's so good. He's amazing. Is he not amazing? And then, you and then you listen to him. You pick the apple, right, instead of the IBM. You pick the apple. <laughs> and, you, and you bite it. And then what does Satan say? Oh! Like, boop! Like the prison alarm goes off. Eh, eh, eh. What? You did it. You told me to do it. He lies to you that it's no big deal. The moment you do it, he makes it a big deal. And he says, what are you going to do now? Are you going to pray and ask God to forgive you? Yep. And he'll tell you, he's not going to do that. If you don't, listen, he speaks so perfectly. If you don't know this voice versus the seductive voice of the wicked one, if you don't have this, you're going down. If you don't know Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, <laughs> you're going down. Because, listen, it's not, I'm not saying it's what you know. It's this book that introduces you to who you should know. It's who you know, not what you know. In Jesus' name, Father God, we pray right now, Lord God, that you would cover this body of believers and Heavenly Father that your Holy Spirit would be that galvanizing force at work in our lives now. We pray over every one of our brothers and sisters here standing that you would, Lord, protect them and then because they are protected, that they would go out into a world and embrace a broken, bleeding, hurt world that has no hope unless we open our mouth and proclaim the everlasting gospel that God forgives sins as we repent of them to him 
because faithful is he who has called us. He has died in our place, canceling the power of sin and death and being resurrected from the dead. He has granted us eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord and all of God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you as we close.